definitive account and the untold story of the split that was dubbed Megxit, how Harry and Meghan split from the House of Windsor. And it is, as I said, a definitive account of how this all went down and the acrimony that existed within the British monarchy related to the actions of the prince and the princess and chronicles just how fractured the family was. So how how did all this happen? Because uh, I remember reading uh, and seeing all sorts of all sorts of things about this, uh, and 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 this got to be a a big deal. Um, how, how did we get to this point? Well, um, Harry has long blamed the monarchy and the media for the death of his mother, Princess Diana. Yep. And though he has been a zealous advocate for philanthropic work, the reality of the situation is he's never really adjusted to life as a royal in the aftermath of his mother's death. In Meghan Markle, he found someone who shared that same common uh, bond of being in a fractured family. Um, not that her father or mother died, but they were divorced and equally shared the same passion for charities and, uh, and, and foundations that Megan did. He was besotted from the moment he met her, but there was a particular moment that really began this divide between the royal family and Harry, and that was a moment in which his brother, Prince Harry, who he seemingly had an unbreakable bond with, contacted him and said, are you sure she's the one? not an uncommon question that any sibling would ask of another sibling. Um, but Harry was very, very upset and angered by that question and believed that it had been fueled by other members of the royal family that he asked that question. So, uh, so began the great divide between Team Markle and Prince Harry and the rest of the monarchy. And there was genuine concern over what they wanted to do. Here was a couple that was uh, driven by Meghan Markle, um, to, to, to use a colloquial frame, uh, phrase, she wore the pants in the relationship, and everything that she did was not necessarily following royal protocol and procedure. Now, that may sound um, to be not of consequence to you and I, but an organisation like the House of Windsor that has been around for over 100 years, and the royal family itself has predated many, many um, hundreds of years, the reality was that not conforming to those procedures and protocols was of major concern to what they call the firm, the royal family. She was someone who uh, bucked every trend that, that the royals wanted. She wore a $6,000 dress to an event. The Queen is notoriously frugal. She insisted on Princess Charlotte, Kate Middleton's daughter, not wearing leggings at a wedding when you're not supposed to show skin as a member of the royal family. And this was Meghan Markle trying to modernise the monarchy in many ways. But the reality was it ruffled royal feathers. Well, and there was a lot of folks uh, I, I seen speculating in, in the tabloids and, and other things that uh, part of the reason why they, uh, they weren't real happy was, uh, was because of the, uh, the obvious situation is that she's black. <laughs> Did that Look, have anything to do with anything? I think the subtext of a lot of the coverage which riled Meghan Markle was racist. Yeah. I really do believe that. Yeah. And I think she was the victim of that. And in court papers filed as part of litigation against the male newspaper group in England, she has said that the royal family effectively gagged her, told her not to respond to the type of coverage that she was receiving uh, through the British tabloids. And she believed that that coverage was racist. Yeah. And that she was being subjected to this and she was not given a voice to speak up in response to it. 
that really upset her. This is a this is someone who at age ten wrote to Procter and Gamble about a commercial that she believed to be uh, racist and sexist, and wrote to First Lady Hillary Clinton. Now I'm not saying the commercial was changed because of Meghan Markle, but she's had <laughs> advocacy uh, in her uh, blood from a very young age. She at school befriended minority groups as opposed to being a member of the in crowd. So for her to be silenced was the antithesis of what she had done in the past. And we're seeing that now. It's unbecoming of a royal to respond to media reports. But now that they're ostracized from the royal family, there is a spokesperson for Harry and Meghan who are speaking out on their behalf and answering and rebutting and refuting certain allegations that are being made. That would be a no-go zone in the (laughs) royal family. So Megan has got effectively what she wanted, but one has to ask this question. Isn't there a great paradox about this whole situation? Here is a couple who said that they wanted to move to Los Angeles to avoid the limelight. Well, the limelight shines brighter nowhere more <laughs> in than L.A. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have got a great guest with us today. Dylan Howard joins us here on our broadcast. He has got a tremendous new book, Royals at War. And uh, why are people so obsessed with the royal family? That was one thing when I was growing up, watching Entertainment Tonight and some of these different shows. Oh my God! They're obsessed with the royal family, and still to this day, these the, these programs are. Uh, why is that? I, I, is it because we don't have royalty in the United States? Look, I think life inside is gilded cage. Whether or not you are a member of a royal family or a celebrity, is something that a lot of women aspire to want to have and it is a rarefied world it is every young woman's dream to be a princess as a child yes. Yes. so there is some sort of fantastical element of the royal family that um, transcends the UK into the United States in many ways we now have our own royal family if they are going to remain in the United States now that could go brilliantly well or it could go horribly well horribly (laughs) bad one only needs to look at the instance of prince andrew and jeffrey epstein to understand that when a royal goes rogue the potential for calamity is high and megan and harry have divorced themselves from a salary from the british taxpayers which means they have to pay for themselves they can earn up to a million dollars a speech But let's hope they don't get corrupted by rogues and renegades who will try and take advantage of them and make money for them. Because if they get entangled with an Epstein-like character, not only does it have the potential to do damage to the monarchy, it has the potential to bring down the monarchy. We have got a great guest with us today, Royals at War, a stunning expose, the untold story of Harry and Meghan's shocking split with the House of Windsor. Uh, when when you first heard about this, what was was this all that shocking to you, or was this you kind of figured this was going to take place? Well, I sort of heard rumblings about their desire to want to relocate uh, towards the end of last year, and I started toiling with the idea of writing the book. And then when they formally announced that they were going to move away from the royal family. Uh, Myself and my co-author Andy Tillett and my team of researchers went into overdrive to get this book out uh, because it is such a fascinating story. Not since uh, King Edward in 1936 as a member of the royal family abdicated the family. Now, of course, he abdicated the throne, a much more uh, sensational situation. But nevertheless, Harry held a very fond... um, part in the the hearts and minds of many of the Brits because he was the the relatable royal. He was the party boy who 
loved to drink and would go to Las Vegas and have a great time. And there was an element of society that appreciated that from him. What they don't appreciate now is the abdication. The Brits believe in the House of Monarchy. Uh, the monarchy has done a tremendous amount of goodwill over the last two decades to rebuild its image in the wake of Princess Diana's death. And even myself as a member, I'm from Australia and we are a member of the Commonwealth, um, I feel cheated that uh, a member of the family has decided that it, it's not for them. You are born into that privilege and you are expected to carry out that privilege. Yes. Um, and it's disappointing totally to agree. see that, that someone is not following that pursuit. We have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here in our broadcast. Dylan Howard is with us. And uh, so what's been some of the feedback you've gotten on this book? Well, I think the most interesting thing was uh, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's spokesperson addressed the book by saying this is full of rumor and speculation. They said that out of one side of their mouth, and out the other side of their mouth they said, they will ensure in the formation of uh, Archwell, which is their foundation, that they won't make mistakes of the past, which is a tacit acknowledgement that things didn't go as planned with their exit from Britain. I think that in itself was the very first time that either Harry or Meghan has acknowledged that they may have done wrong in the way in which it was handled. Of course, this was an announcement that was made to the public before it was even told to the Queen, which is disrespect of the highest order. Yes. One thing that we do know, though, is since moving to California, the relationship between William and Harry and the relationship between uh, Harry, Charles and the Queen has began to rebuild itself off the back of COVID-19. Uh, Prince Charles contracted the disease his grandmother, the Queen, Elizabeth, at age 94, had to self-quarantine at Windsor Castle. His grandfather is 99 years of age. He is a guy who's moved to the other side of the world, uh, divorced himself from the family, and felt isolated and helpless at a time of need for his family. And that really set him into an emotional uh, spiral, according to people that I spoke with. What brought him out of that cycle was philanthropic work. He was photographed delivering food to those in the need uh, and homeless. And also, him and Megan volunteered at a Skid Row, the notorious gang area of uh, Los downtown Los Angeles. They volunteered at, at, a, at a foundation that helps reformed gang members associate back into society. So they've been doing a tremendous amount of good um, since coming to Los Angeles, as difficult as it might well have been for them. But I think that that's important. I think it's important that they're seen to be contributing to the community because that's what they pledged to do. And they're still doing that even during COVID-19, which is refreshing to see. Well, as we wrap up here with you, my friend, how do we find you online, get the book, everything else? You can... Uh, 